So I think that we can get started. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Barbara Pistilli, medical oncologist at Gustave Roussy. I'm uh, replacing Fabrice André that uh, apologizes he cannot be here today. And uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, the title is uh, The Latest Trends in Adjuvant Endocrine Therapy. So we have uh, three lectures, uh, each of them lasting about uh, 25, 30 minutes. And we have a QA session at the end, uh, 20 minutes of, of discussion, questions uh, that you can have. So thank you very much for joining, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Vered Stearns, from uh, the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center, Baltimore, that is going to speak about optimizing endocrine therapy in premenopausal women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your patience and uh, for uh, all of you who are not aware, I just have, about a month ago moved to Cornell where uh, I uh, will serve as Director of Translational Breast Cancer and Associate Director for Clinical Services, so thank you. Uh, my focus will be on treating perimenopausal women and of course it's impossible to cover everything in 20-25 uh, minutes, so please uh, keep some of your questions to the discussion period. Okay, so compared to postmenopausal women, uh, breast cancer in premenopausal women uh, is associated with more diagnostic delays. Uh, women are more likely to be diagnosed with later stages of the disease and have more aggressive tumor subtypes and characteristics such as having grade three tumors. Their tumors are more likely to be hormone receptor negative, and there are other biological differences that we'll discuss today. There's also more likely uh, to be genetic predisposition. Many of these women will require extensive multi-modality, multi-year therapy. Uh, and despite very uh, optimal local and systemic treatment, their survival outcomes are a bit inferior compared to women with similar tumor subtypes who are older. So even in this Premenopausal women, the majority are, of tumors are hormone receptor positive, uh, luminal like. It's possible the distribution between luminal A and luminal B, whether HER2 positive or negative, is different than the older woman's tumor. But again, the majority are hormone receptor positive and will require endocrine therapy. Uh, those women are candidates for five to 10 years of endocrine therapy and some of the complexities in the decision making. Um, I will not talk about chemotherapy. My colleague, Dr. Metzger, will discuss chemotherapy. And there's additional agents such as CDK inhibitors. Uh, there are some tools that help us, help us decide who might benefit from chemotherapy in addition to endocrine therapy, but the focus of my talk will be endocrine therapy. Um, so first I'll talk a little bit about uh, selection and risk stratification for breast cancer recurrence. I will talk about online calculators, composite scores, and multi-parameter gene expression profiles, um, and uh, talk a little bit about the decision-making between tamoxifen, ovarian function suppression with tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor. And I will not talk, but wanted to just put it out there about CDK inhibitors, PARP inhibitors, and bone-modifying agents. But of course, women should be considered for those um, agents. So risk certification, what do we know? Uh, there are some online calculators. And those are things that change over time. The one that are mainly used today to help estimate the benefit from endocrine therapy and chemoendocrine therapies are uh, the PREDICT tool from the UK and the Cancer Math based on the SEER database. Uh, and those are tools that can help you when you discuss with the patient uh, her treatment options. There are composite scores. IHC-4 incorporates standard ERPR and HER2 and KI-67. Uh, it is prognostic of outcomes. Uh, it is not predictive of the choice of endocrine therapy. And of course, there's the complexity of K67 determination. It's not always determined, or there, there's some complexity related to um, the analytics. 
The CTS5 score is also a, a very compelling. It includes clinical and pathological information, but it was developed and validated in postmenopausal women, majority receiving aromatase inhibitors. Uh, it is prognostic, but at least today, I believe that further validation is needed before considering this in premenopausal women. And there are multiple uh, commercially available, available multi-parameter gene expression, Oncotype DX and Mammaprint um, have some of the largest data sets, respectively, that incorporated premenopausal women. There are some additional newer data related to BCI uh, and PAM50. And then what I'm most excited about is what I think we're going to learn in the future, and I'll get back to that uh, at the end of the talk, which is Many of these women's tumors uh, may be biologically a little bit different than their older counterparts, and we're starting to see data looking at frequencies of mutations, so their higher frequencies of GATA3 mutations, amplifications, um, their higher frequency of HRD-related features, and uh, also less frequent ESR1 copy number gain, high rate of ESR1 copy number loss. So again, some of these things tell us those tumors could be a little bit biologically different, and maybe the tools they were using today, like as those gene expression assays, do not give us a comprehensive picture uh, that we can use as we predict sensitivity to current treatments. So let me start by talking a little bit about the role of Oncotype uh, DX. Of course, uh, Oncotype has been studied prospectively in Telorex in women who were no negative and responder in women with one to three positive lymph nodes. Um, and uh, this is uh, the main results from Telorex published in 2018. Uh, whereas you can see women with the recurrence score of the intermediate uh, uh, values between 11 to 25 have benefited, this is a women younger than 50. So those women benefited from chemoendocrine therapy compared to endocrine therapy alone, and the higher your risk, recurrence risk score, the more benefit you have received. So at least today, uh, we should be having discussion with those non-negative women uh, regarding the role of chemotherapy. Uh, looking further uh, at in incorporating clinical risk, uh, again, if you look at um, here we go. Let's see. Um, well, it's a little hard to get there, so I'm, I'm going to not use the mouse, but the, the uh, laser. But uh, if you look at the um, at, at the plots, there is benefit to chemoendocrine therapy pretty consistently when you get to the score of 16, 20, and then more so through uh, 21 to 25. Uh, and if you look at ages, again, women are premenopausal under the age of 50, benefit for chemoendocrine therapy. When you look at women, even if they're still uh, premenopausal but older than 50, the benefit from chemotherapy diminishes. And those are the results from responders looking at both uh, distant recurrence and overall survival. There is a benefit to chemoendocrine therapy compared to endocrine therapy alone in premenopausal women with what, one to three positive lymph nodes. And looking at women who were randomized in the MIND Act study, so those were women with clinical high risk, but genomic low risk based on the mammoprint assays and were younger than 50. Again, women receiving chemoendocrine therapy had superior outcomes compared to women who were getting endocrine therapy alone. So based on that, looking at ASCO guideline and additional um, uh, consensus, we believe that risk stratification multigene assays could be helpful in the premenopause women. They're mostly prognostic, uh, but we must look at the clinical risk of these women and decide, number one, do we order the test? How do we use the test? And then uh, what women we should be considering for chemo endocrine therapy and the tests for whom should not be ordered. So uh, this is just a, a summary slide. So if you have a, a low tumor that uh, is uh, of, of low grade, you may not need to order an oncotype or a mammoprint, but if your tumor is a little bit larger and have other low risk categories, uh, do consider oncotype and consider endocrine therapy alone if the score is less than 15. And likewise, if the mammoprint 
is low and the clinical risk is low, consider omitting chemotherapy. But the women who are at high risk and are not negative and have oncotype recurrence score of greater than 15 or one to three positive nodes or more than four positive nodes, chemotherapy should be discussed with those patients. Now, uh, somehow I, uh, I did incorporate uh, the slide talking about NRG study BR009, but that's going to be an important study in which premenopausal women will be randomized to endocrine therapy, which is ovarian suppression and aromatase inhibitor plus minus chemotherapy. Okay, how about the specific adjuvant uh, therapy decisions? So we know that five years of tamoxifen are associated with significant reduction both in local systemic and uh, uh, secondary, secondary breast cancers. And compared to five years, extending the treatment to 10 years or substituting five years of tamoxifen with ovarian suppression with tamoxifen and aromat or aromatase inhibitor is superior to five years of tamoxifen. And a reminder of some of the studies that looked at 10 versus five years of tamoxifen, two of the largest studies include the ATLAS study, uh, where both recurrence and breast cancer mortality were lower in patients who received uh, 10 years of tamoxifen, and the benefit continues um, over the second five-year period. Uh, in the ADAM study, likewise, recurrence was reduced in patients who continued tamoxifen beyond five years. And Tex and Soft studies were the largest uh, studies that uh, randomize patients to ovarian suppression with tamoxifen or eczemastin. As a reminder, uh, the Tex study included ovarian suppression in both arms, and women received either tamoxifen or eczemastin. Uh, whereas in the Soft study, women could have received tamoxifen, ovarian suppression, tamoxifen, or tamoxifen and eczemastin. And the first result included a joint analysis of all the women who were on the ovarian suppression arms, and it demonstrated improvement in disease-free survival in women receiving ovarian suppression eczemastin compared to tamoxifen and ovarian suppression. Um, this is a more recent 12-year analysis from the SOFT study showing that there were marginal differences in ovarian survival and uh, distant recurrence-free survival. Uh, when you look at the entire populations, but if you look more specifically in disease-free survival in uh, patients according to the intent to treat, there was significant benefits to women receiving ovarian suppression and AI compared to ovarian suppression and tamoxifen, and both ovarian suppression arms were better than tamoxifen alone. And also, if you look at the uh, HER2 negative tumors, women who received prior chemotherapy, the benefits were uh, substantial in the ovarian suppression arm and uh, more so in the eczemastin compared to tamoxifen. Uh, the ASTRA trial was just published in 2023 as well with eight-year disease-free survival. And as a reminder here, women younger, younger than 45 were randomized to five years of tamoxifen or five years of tamoxifen and two years of ovarian suppression. I think this is an important study. It showed that there was substantial benefit to adding this two years of ovarian suppression. Um, and finally, looking at the comparisons of uh, tamoxifen or AI with ovarian suppression, the early breast cancer trial is collaborative group. Has, has looked at four studies totaling 7,000 patient uh, data and have demonstrated, again, that being on an AI and ovarian suppression was slightly superior to being on ovarian suppression and tamoxifen. Now, again, the, the benefits are significant, but I, I, again, want everybody to remember that their uh, substantial benefits are still to tamoxifen and should be considered, especially if there is toxicity. Uh, there was no benefit, uh, no to date, uh, substantial benefit in regards to mortality, either due to breast cancer or cause. Looking at subgroups, I know it's hard to see, but being a younger age, 35 to 44, having a progesterone receptor positive tumor or HER2 negative tumor was more uh, predictive of benefit to the aromatase inhibitor. So how do, how do we make decisions for individual women? It's tough. We can discuss the options and data with them. But one tool that 
uh, I find very helpful is from the uh, Softon Tax Investigator that developed um, a step methodology analysis, and the website is available where you can plug in the combination that's pertinent to your own patient and uh, develop a composite risk value and look at the potential benefit from each of this treatment. And I'll show you just one example. So this is what the website looks like, and it's um, um, uh, and, and the uh, link is uh, on this slide. So you can put in the age and some of the tumor characteristic, and then uh, your, your patient uh, composite score will be compared to one of a uh, soft tax patient, and you can choose whether or not the patient would receive chemotherapy, and then you can, uh, in this particular example, this is ovarian suppression uh, combination, and you can tell the patient what her benefit would be if she took tamoxifen or, or eczemastin. So I find it very, very helpful in the clinic. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about adverse events and quality of life. Um, this is from the um, um, uh, overview, and it shows that there's really no difference in non-breast cause mortality between aromatase inhibitor and tamoxifen in women receiving ovarian suppression. And again, as expected, more endometrial cancers in tamoxifen-treated women and more fractures in AI-treated women. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll skip a couple of those just uh, uh, so we can uh, save some time, but we try to also incorporate some of the potential interventions and remind um, the clinical teams to ask patients about potential side effects, the most common one being musculoskeletal, vasomotor uh, symptoms, uh, sexual dysfunction is not something we ask a lot about, but 25 to 50% of patients will have symptoms, fatigue, weight, sleep, and so on. And we also listed some uh, potential in intervention. The number of, uh, of side effects obviously is more, goes up as the treatment escalates. So women who are receiving ovarian suppression and tamoxifen are more, like, more likely to report vasomotor symptoms, vaginal uh, dryness, sexual dysfunction, and sleep disturbance. Uh, in the Canto um, study, also, the, you can see differences in symptoms. So younger women are more likely to develop hot flushes, night sweat, attention disorder, and headaches compared to their postmenopausal women. So it's important for us to know the data specific to the premenopausal women. Um, and again, another uh, really nice tool that you can refer to for interventions and the evidence before, beyond the intervention to help women tackle their symptoms. Other things that we don't have time to talk about today but are important in the premenopausal patients are genetic testing and counseling, fertility preservation, uh, remind them to avoid hormonal methods of contraception, and uh, I want to talk just a little bit about treatment interruption for pregnancy, remind you to monitor bone health and maintain ideal body weight and remain physically active. So just as last year, the positive trial cohort study results were presented, and, um, and this was a court study when women who ER positive tumors um, uh, elected to interrupt their hormonal therapy between 18 and 36 months and take about a year off this endocrine treatment to attempt a pregnancy, and their outcomes, their disease recurrence was compared to women who were enrolled in soft and tax. And as you can see, there was no significant difference between the prospective court and the um, expected outcomes from the soft and tax trial. So how do we put this all together? Uh, if a woman is premenopausal or diagnosis, the first thing I would do is risk assessment. If the woman is at low risk of recurrence, you can consider tamoxifen alone. If she's at high risk, chemotherapy would be considered ovarian suppression with tamoxifen or an AI for five years. There are no data regarding ovarian suppression beyond five, five years. And consider a CDK inhibitor, as we'll discuss a little bit more later. Uh, in both groups, you can consider extended endocrine therapy, and it'll depend on the original risk, the tolerance, 
to the treatment and patient preference. If a patient becomes postmenopausal, you can continue tamoxifen or switch to an AI. If she remains premenopausal, you can consider if she's at very high risk of five years of tamoxifen. And just lastly, I wanted to show a couple of slides from studies that have been published recently. First is from a court from the SAF study looking at genomic landscape of premenopausal women. And basically what you can see is that there are uh, diversity of mutations and those mutations, the existence of specific mutations correlates with recurrence. Um, and the second is from a, a, a TCGA and other uh, cohorts that looked at somatic mutation profiles, and there are differences. Women who are younger seem to have less tumor mutation burden, but maybe more uh, specific mutation, Legato 3 mutation. What does that mean, uh, and how could that be targeted? I'm not sure yet, but the message that I wanted to give you from those is that some of what we know today and some of the assays available to us today, such as those um, genomic Gene, uh, gene expression profiles may not be comprehensive enough for us to understand the risk of recurrence and response to our current therapy in those very young women. So in summary, the majority of premenopausal women with breast cancer will have luminal-like tumors. Uh, nonetheless, many of them have high-risk tumor and require multimodality therapy. Uh, we need to carefully evaluate their recurrence risk to help guide treatment decisions, uh, and also type and duration. Hopefully more data will be helpful for us in the future. Consider patient demographics, tumor characteristic. Um, other tools hopefully will become available to us, and hopefully we'll have a better understanding in the future of the complex genomic landscape, we'll have machine learning approaches to help us, and something, again, we don't know very much about in this group is minimal residual disease and how to monitor for recurrence. Uh, remember to consider risk and benefits in patients who are developing symptoms and um, help with aggressive symptom management and approaches to wellness. And with that, I'll thank you and uh, let the uh, la ne next speaker go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stems. So the next speaker is going to speak about another population, postmenopausal women, how to treat postmenopausal patients, Dr. Rachel Friedman from Dana Farber Cancer Institute, Boston. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon to talk about the bread and butter of what we see in our practices on uh, adjuvant endocrine therapy for postmenopausal patients. These are my disclosures. So breast cancer is common in postmenopause. Many of you have seen these registry data um, noting that 71% of breast cancers are diagnosed at ages 55 and older in the United States. And the fastest growing group of survivors across the spectrum of cancers, not just breast cancer, are those in the 75 and older age group with a huge projected uh, increase in the number of living survivors in the US by the year 2040. Currently, about 20% of breast cancers are diagnosed in ages 75 and older. And why is this all gonna increase for us? Well, it may be obvious, but people in the US are living longer. We have population growth. Uh, there's an increased risk for breast cancer with increasing age, and we have seen improved breast cancer mortality. And so if you do the math, we are expected to see a growing number of postmenopausal and older uh, breast cancer survivors in our clinics over time. And among cancers diagnosed in this population, about 90% of them are hormone receptor positive. Um, of 8% of those are also HER2 positive, so the vast majority of our postmenopausal patients need to be considered for adjuvant hormonal therapy. And despite this being a very common entity, older adults are poorly represented on clinical trials to date across the board. We looked at Alliance trials um, for breast cancer in the adjuvant, neoadjuvant, and metastatic setting from 1985 through 2012, looking at adjuvant, neoadjuvant, and metastatic accruals. And most relevant to this talk is the adjuvant line, with 15% of patients being 65 and older and only 7% being 70 and older. So I think we can all agree that this is not uh, representative of the populations that we're seeing in practice. 
And if we look at the rainbow of trials um, that have been used to set our, um, our practice in the setting of ER positive breast cancer, there have been many thousands of patients enrolled to these trials to date. And unfortunately, only a handful of them report race and ethnicity, and no, not a single trial reports anything related to sociodemographic factors, insurance, or comorbidity. The FACE trial is the only trial that has reported um, WHO performance status, but I think we can all agree that we've lost a lot not being able to learn from the many thousands of patients who have enrolled on these studies because of the lack of detailed data collection and reporting that's been happening. And so it's hard not to mention thinking about diversity in our clinical trials. I think as we're designing our clinical trials, we really need to think about access more and making trials more available in the community where most patients are getting their care. We need to be dedicating trials to underrepresented groups and perhaps expanding our accrual goals so to make sure that patients are representative of who we're seeing in practice and really work on collecting more granular data for who does enroll um, so that we can report on that data, ed, data and learn from it and think about this always proactively. So now getting to the topic of hormonal therapy. Um, these data you've seen multiple times, and Dr. Stearns showed this as well. Um, this is sort of the basics of hormonal therapy, looking at the overview data of tamoxifen versus no therapy for five years. And shown here are the substantial benefits that persist at 15 years after therapy, even after five years of therapy, both with regard to recurrence and mortality, um, changing uh, breast cancer practice effectively. Um, these data have been sliced and diced in many ways, um, and this is the, uh, these are the forest plots by age, showing a consistent um, benefit of tamoxifen across the age spectrum, although again, some subsets are not well represented here. But in general, we all know that the benefits of tamoxifen are seen regardless of menopause status, regardless of chemotherapy receipt, regardless of your node status, and we know that five years is better than one to two years, which I'm not going to review here. And so we've made significant progress over time. Tamoxifen was approved in 1977. It took us 18 years to get to an approval with anastrozole. And over time, we have seen tremendous uh, uh, increase in the pace of uh, drug approvals. And the ones highlighted here in orange are the ones that are currently approved in the adjuvant setting, um, with more to come, I'm sure, in the coming year or two. And so the adjuvant endocrine therapy decision-making today has become a little bit more complicated than tamoxifen versus none. We now have to think about tamoxifen versus AI and which AI, potentially. Um, should we be doing sequential therapy? Should we be adding CDK4-6 inhibitors? And how long should we be giving our therapy? Five years, 10 years, or maybe something in between? And so thinking about those first five years in the postmenopausal patient, these are the monotherapy data um, from the ATAC and BIG198 trials, looking at five years of an aromatase inhibitor versus five years of tamoxifen. Um, at very long-term follow-up, there is a pretty consistent uh, disease-free survival advantage with aromatase inhibitors in this monotherapy setting. But if you look at some of the subgroups, the lowest risk patients um, in the plots actually have a questionable uh, benefit of aromatase inhibitor that may not be detectable but is limited by numbers, and there has been no survival advantage over time. So the takeaway from these monotherapy studies is that um, AI is superior to tamoxifen with regard to disease outcomes, uh, but not overall survival for the most part, and perhaps not in the lowest risk patients. We also know that the efficacy of AIs is similar across ages. Big 198 did a sub-study looking at the benefits of the monotherapy arms, tamoxifen and letrozole, in patients by age, and at a median of 40 months. Uh, the same disease-free benefits were seen in the oldest patients on, um, on Big 198 compared with the youngest patients. There was more letrozole-related bone fractures on this study, but there was not an age effect seen, surprisingly. Um, and of note, older women were less likely to complete five years of therapy regardless of their treatment assignment, with 38 patients ages 75 and older not finishing five years of therapy compared to about a quarter of those uh, younger. And so this is a sea of trials looking at early switch strategies. Again, this is the first five years. So the top blue, the top blue rows are looking at tamoxifen versus a sequence of tamoxifen and AI. Um, IES, ARNO95, and the ITA trial, now all reporting long-term follow-up with pretty consistent uh, disease-free survival advantages for the groups uh, transitioning to aromatase inhibitor. Again, overall survival um, is not improved except in the ER-positive subgroups of IES once they eliminated the ER unknown and negatives. 
And in the bottom bars um, in orange, the TEAM trial and the BIG-198 trial, which had additional arms besides monotherapy, looked at aromatase inhibitor uh, followed by tamoxifen um, or aromatase inhibitor the whole way. And BIG-198, of course, looked at the sequence both with tamoxifen letrozole and letrozole tamoxifen. And in these trials, there was no advantage uh, to the monotherapy arms um, for aromatase inhibitor uh, across the board. So as long as you got some aromatase inhibitor therapy, whether it was monotherapy or sequential, uh, you, you had, uh, you had a, a superior outcomes to tamoxifen alone. And so the takeaway uh, from these switch strategies in the first five years is that AI, having AI um, in the first five years is superior to tamoxifen alone. Uh, but the sequential strategies do mirror the monotherapy data. And again, overall survival is not substantially different across the populations. There have been a lot of subgroup analyses within BIG-198 looking at whether the magnitude of benefit may differ, whether or not you had invasive ductal or invasive lobular carcinoma. And my colleague, Dr. Metzger, published this study showing that there um, may be a, a larger magnitude of benefit for adjuvant letrozole in those with invasive lobular cancer, certainly intriguing, and has led to further study of how we can differentiate our treatment based on subtype. And I think we uh, can all agree that the AIs that selected uh, shouldn't matter. There have been a number of studies looking at this, both in the adjuvant setting, which is shown here, and the neoadjuvant setting. But MA27 and FACE really confirmed that these aromatase inhibitors perform very similarly and have similar toxicity profiles. I would consider them to have similar efficacy. And although we all know that they can have similar toxicity, um, the individual can have very different experiences with agent to agent, and it's worth trying if one isn't tolerating one of these agents. And although tamoxifen is old news, um, there's been a resurgence of how to think about dosing in tamoxifen. Um, we've seen this in the DCIS setting, and there's a concept moving through the alliance right now called LOTAM uh, that Dean Shumway is chairing, looking at in the low-risk population of patients with ER-positive disease and tumors less than three centimeters, can we give low-dose tamoxifen for five years versus standard dose and have similar efficacy? I hope this trial uh, moves along. It's still in the concept phase, but um, I'm hopeful that it will move forward. And there are also data in the aromatase inhibitor setting around dosing. Tafaya Haddad presented data at San Antonio last year looking at higher dose aromatase inhibitor therapies for those uh, showing inadequate estradiol suppression. And there are more data from this trial uh, forthcoming in publications, but again, sort of bringing and questioning the dosing strategies that were established so long ago. So how do you choose? Um, I think we all need to balance the benefits with toxicity. Tamoxifen consistently has more thromboembolic events, fewer bone fractures, however, and fewer musculoskeletal events, less arthralgia, a small added endometrial risk, but no difference in survival when compared with AI for most patients. Aromatase inhibitors come with more bone density in bone events, uh, perhaps have more toxicity overall, although I think that's a little bit uh, undecided. No added endometrial risk, fewer thromboembolic events, perhaps less cognitive impairment according to a sub-study in BIG-198. There's question about whether a BMI should impact our decision making around whether to choose AI or tamoxifen. And again, disease-free survival advantages, perhaps most apparent in the highest risk setting. And I think quality of life and cardiovascular events are sort of equivocal um, on these agents. And I think we all have seen in the longer, t the, longer the time on the uh, agent, the more events will occur. And so thinking about the first five years, AIs perform better, but with limited demonstration of survival benefit. The higher risk patient, I would consider upfront aromatase inhibitor, but the remaining patients have options for switch strategies or even tamoxifen alone uh, for the lowest risk patients or people who may have contraindication to aromatase inhibitor with severe bone density loss at the get-go. Um, toxicity is the leading reason for treatment discontinuation and poor adherence in patients. Um, sequential strategies are perhaps an appealing way to overcome some of the uh, toxicity that can occur with each agent with a limited exposure over the five years. And I think we all need to do better about asking um, our patients about adherence and the reasons why patients aren't taking their medication. And, um, and as the good Dr. Burstein uh, always says, choose the medication that they will take and tolerate. And I think um, this is really important because we know that tolerability is incredibly variable. And I think we need to show patients uh, how much this matters. Um, these are data from Don Hirschman, now over a decade old, really um, uh, showing the associations between poor adherence with hormonal therapy over five years and outcomes. 
So on the left are bar charts. So if you had a medication possession ratio of less than 60%, you had over a three-fold increase um, in breast cancer death. And uh, similar findings looking at adherence and non-adherence over time. And you can see over time as patients come off therapy that that difference is widening. And we all know um, since early data in 2003, I think first published by Ann Partridge, that adherence worsens over time. Uh, this is still the case. This paper was published just a few months ago looking at Sear Medicare Part D data and use of endocrine therapy over time, again showing a decrease in the use of endocrine therapy with each year over the five-year period. And this study also showed um, with every one-year increase in persistence, um, there was a 37% decrease in breast cancer deaths. There are some limitations and takeaways from Sir Medicare and survival, but I think we can all agree that this is suboptimal. And even in the context of clinical trial populations, adherence is low. This is a texting intervention that Don Hirschman led in SWOG, showing completely overlapping results for adherence based on uh, whether or not a person received texting intervention or not. And um, unfortunately, all patients on the study had very poor adherence, um, regardless of their assigned group. And toxicity is such a huge variable in adherence that we need to do better at asking patients about this and understanding the variability of this. This was a really interesting study led by Stephanie Wheeler at UNC looking at the variability and toxicity for patients on hormonal therapy by race. And as you can see here, there is variability with all of these um, toxicities uh, reported with black patients overall reporting more toxicity with hormonal therapy compared to white patients. And I think that there's a lot that we can do to better inform our patients about decisions when therapies are discontinued. Um, this was part of that same study by uh, Stephanie Wheeler, um, which asked patients about their perceived risk um, of their breast cancer if pills were discontinued. And you can see that 20% of black patients on this study said that they would not have any change in their outcome compared with 9% of white patients. And so I think we have a lot of work to do and explaining what our treatments are actually doing and helping um, motivate patients to continue. I have a deep um, interest in tumor knowledge and whether understanding treatment rationales impacts adherence. And we did a survey project looking at tumor knowledge of a diverse group of patients in Boston and New York. And what we found was that there was tremendous variety in what people knew about their tumors. Um, and so as you can see highlighted in the blue box here, um, 62 and 67% of black and Hispanic patients knew their hormone receptor status. And we, we, um, we asked them what they thought it was and we compared it with medical record data. Um, and you can see the other uh, tumor features are also uh, variable in knowledge by patients. Patients also had variable understanding of the principles, the basic principles of endocrine therapy. So these were true-false questions that people um, were asked in a survey. Um, HT is as effective in older women as younger women. Um, you can see many patients think that that's not true. Um, hormone therapy kills cancer cells, helps you live longer, lowers risk of distant recurrence, and lowers risk in your breast or scar. Again, tremendous variability here, and patients understanding sort of the basic tenets of why they're on therapy. And so moving into uh, the next decision point, uh, we have our CDK4-6 inhibition decision-making, which Dr. Metzger is going to cover in depth. So I just have a couple slides on this because it's hard not to acknowledge it. Um, but these are our major um, adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor trials that have been reported to date, with abemacycla being the only FDA-approved um, um, adjunct to hormonal therapy at this time. Um, and the Natalie trial also showing early um, disease uh, 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 efficacy um, uh, with, uh, compared with patients not taking ribocyclib. The Penelope B and Palace trials with palbocyclib have been negative to date. And of note, thinking about toxicity and adherence, abemacyclib has a very high discontinuation rate. Um, in these data, you can see on the right with the bar chart that, you know, the first uh, four months of treatment are crucial uh, with regard to toxicity. That's where most of the toxicity is happening. Um, about 18% of patients stopped taking uh, abemacycle on monarchy because of toxicity. 5% was due to diarrhea. And I think that we can do uh, better here in making this a tolerable drug, especially as our longer-term outcomes are showing persistent advantages to being on this agent. 
And I just want to highlight my colleague Erica Mayer's um, recently opened trade trial, which is looking at dose escalation of abemacyclib in the adjuvant setting. So in patients meeting criteria for monarchy, where you're going to be starting abemacyclib, there is a slow dose, there is a slow dose escalation if patients are tolerating therapy well with the goal to get them to full dose, uh, but with a better experience along the way. And this trial is currently enrolling. There are obviously differences between the Natalie and Monarchy populations, with uh, Natalie including a lower risk population and stage two no negative patients. Um, there are multiple nuances between these trials, and um, you know, Dr. Metzger will be going over that. But it's hard to ignore the back of the envelope math with these agents as we think about bringing them into clinic more and more. This is just public information that I took uh, from these websites. Uh, but if you calculate two years of abemacyclib, it's $348,000. A ribocyclib, $540,000 because it is three years of therapy. And of course, this is just those therapies. It's not including any other part of their cancer care. There's also more stringent company assistance plans coming in 2024 where patients will have to be lower uh, above the po lower uh, levels above the pottery, poverty level to qualify for medication assistance. And of course, this causes uh, concern for widening disparities. And so takeaways, we've seen some short-term and intermediate-term um, benefits of two of these agents. We need more follow-up. Abemacyclib is really our only FDA-approved option, um, and I would consider ribocyclib in the setting of intolerance to abemacyclib at the moment. Cost is clearly a barrier, and much more to come from Dr. Metzger, and the Natalie trial is getting an update uh, at this meeting in a couple days. So we look forward to that. So finally, uh, data on uh, uh, longer-term use of these agents. Um, we all know that recurrence risk for ER-positive breast cancer is very long-term. Over half of recurrences happen after five years, and the risk for late recurrence is related to various high-risk clinical factors. But most patients don't actually experience recurrence still, and so identifying those um, is challenging as we think about extension of therapy. So there are multiple strategies to consider here. Bear with me. I'll try to go through these data quickly, but um, you've already heard a little bit um, from Dr. Stearns about Atlas and Adam, which looked at extension of tamoxifen after five years of tamoxifen, so 10 full years of therapy, showing a difference um, in the long-term risk for recurrence. Again, no, um, again, this was, um, these were seen later, um, as Dr. Sturds uh, mentioned, where the early effects were not seen. It was really that the differences and outcomes emerged much later in follow-up. There, there is a modest survival benefit that has um, emerged from longer-term tamoxifen, but there's also increased risk for the rare serious events like endometrial cancer and thromboembolic disease. Interestingly, there was less ischemic heart disease on the extension, um, and there were very similar results reported from the ADAM trial, um, again, with the same uh, similar increased risk for the AEs. The second strategy on this table is tamoxifen for five years, followed by an aromatase inhibitor for five years versus placebo with the MA17 and NSABP B33 trials. MA17 uh, really showed a disease-free survival advantage um, with extending tamoxifen to letrozole. Once this reported, it did impact NSABP B33, which had to halt accrual and offered a crossover uh, for patients to exemestine, which many of them took, uh, perhaps muting the effects um, for this trial with differences, but just borderline significant. There were no um, overall survival benefits and moderate uh, increase in, aroma, in um, adverse events on this trial. NSABP B42 is not highlighted here, but looked at a similar question. The MA17R study looked at the sort of these are the longest extension um, data that we have. Um, and so uh, patients on this study were at a median of 10 years since their diagnosis, um, and they were on extension of um, aromatase inhibitor for five years after completing up to 10 years of prior tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitor prior to enrollment. Um, and there was, again, a disease-free advantage with those continuing on long-term letrozole, um, no overall survival advantage. And it's of note that with all these extension studies, if you look at the tables and the types of things that are happening for events, a lot of this is contralateral breast cancer, local regional recurrences, um, and not distant disease. ABCSG6A looked at a shorter duration of aromatase inhibitor after five years of therapy, here showing that three years of an AI uh, compared with placebo after five years of tamoxifen also has a disease-free uh, survival advantage similar to what we have seen in the other studies I just reported. And we've also had the ideal study looking at two and a half versus five years of extended AI therapy after completing any sort of combination for the first five years. 
Um, with this study, um, it did not show an advantage to be on AI longer. And so there was complete overlap in the curves for people on therapy, a total of seven and a half years versus 10 years. And a lot of the events that were happening were, again, second breast cancers. Um, there was no group um, in their subgroup analysis that came through as really benefiting from the longest um, duration on this study. Um, but I think many of us consider 10 years of therapy in our highest risk patients. And finally, the Soleil trial looked at uh, intermittent versus continuous extension um, in patients who are node positive coming off of prior um, hormonal therapy in the first five years. Um, again, overlapping uh, uh, curves here showing that there can be flexibility um, in these extension years around duration and frequency. And so this is a chart that I took from the St. Gallen International Breast Cancer Conference this year, looking at who needs extension. Um, and I think a lot of us would probably mirror this, where you're stage one. I think many of us would stop therapy at five years, but when you're stage three, most of us are pushing to 10 if we can. Uh, but I do think that the first five years remain the most important um, and have the most uh, benefit uh, with um, with additional years with a more modest benefit uh, after those first five. But decisions about extension really have to consider risk of recurrence, preferences, and experiences on those first five years. And we have flexibility, fortunately, given all these different sequences that we have looked at. Ember 4 is currently enrolling right now, looking at a different way to extend um, within Lunestrant as a CERD. Um, so data will be coming from this as this trial enrolls. I'm looking at a new option for extension beyond the aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen data. And I think we really all want to know how we're going to identify patients who may be at most risk for those late relapses. There's a number of signatures that have been out there. Um, I'm showing data here from CTS-5. Um, the NCCN is now including some information on breast cancer index as a potential way um, to consider extension. I think most of us are still using clinical factors, but these tools do exist um, if we want to use them in making decisions with patients, particularly perhaps in a patient having a lot of toxicity who you want to extend and trying to understand um, whether or not she may benefit or not. There's growing data on ctDNA and how it can predict late recurrences. Um, in this paper um, that was presented last year at ASCO and now published in JCO by Heather Parsons and um, Marla Lipscar from um, UCLA now looking at 83 patients in our practice who are diagnosed well before uh, with no clinical evidence of recurrence and a medium follow-up of two years from blood samples. Eight patients had positive MRD and um, six patients developed distant metastasis. All had positive ctDNA prior to relapse with a lead time of about 12.4 months. So this is a small study, but obviously lots of questions um, and excitement around how we can do better for patients in predicting this. I'll just skip over this. Um, and the EORTC is now looking at a way to intervene on ctDNA. I think this trial is about to activate. Um, it's for stage two and three patients. Who are, or, or patients who had residual disease at their surgery, they have a ctDNA evaluation. And if they are positive and without recurrence by imaging, they are randomized to stay on their hormonal therapy or to go on LSS strand daily. The Pallavi study is also enrolling right now through the TBCRC. Angie D. Michelle is the PI of this trial. Again, looking at whether disseminated tumor cells found in a bone marrow aspirate um, uh, is, a, is a marker for recurrence. And there are four arms of treatments if patients do have disseminated tumor cells in their marrow aspirate. And I think really interesting study um, with data forthcoming. So in summary, the first five years for low intermediate risk patients, I think any AI or sequential therapy, tamoxifen if low risk or toxicity concerns. The highest risk patients for now have a bemacyclib and extension of therapy considerations for seven to 10 years. And I think, um, again, going back to the basics of the first five years and adherence, it's hard to push somebody past into extension if they're not able to take those first five years. So I think getting people to that uh, first milestone is really important. Patients with higher risk disease will benefit from CDK4-6 inhibition from what we know now. And I think as far as extension goes in the node negative early, um, early stage setting, I think five to eight years is very reasonable. But for those really high risk patients, perhaps pushing to 10 years makes sense. Lots of clinical factors to um, identify patients at risk, but we obviously need better biomarkers paired with novel therapies and more access to trials for diverse populations. Thank you.
So thank you, Dr. Friedman, for uh, this lecture. The last speaker is uh, Dr. Otto Metzger from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, who benefits from CDK46 inhibitor and chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the organizing committee for the opportunity to present here. Congratulate my colleagues, Dr. Friedman and Stearns, for the great presentation. The topic here is who benefits from uh, chemotherapy and CDK inhibitors. And while we are very excited with the data from CDK inhibitors, most of this presentation is going to cover uh, some controversial aspects that we have about who benefits from chemotherapy. Here are my disclosures. And when we think about chemotherapy and adjuvant chemotherapy in general, we should always remember that the tumor burden depicted by the tumor size and other status, those are very important indicators of risk of recurrence. And over the past 10 years or so, uh, and here thinking about patients with node negative or limited node involvement, we did uh, a lot of progress with tailored chemotherapy recommendations for this subset of patients. And we want to divide this presentation into this population that I consider having a low to intermediate risk by tumor burden. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about patients with high tumor burden. And we're going to revisit uh, the data that we know from the three major clinical trials that inform our clinical practice and try to dissect the information that we uh, have learned from these trials. And the question here is, are those tests, the genomic tests that we use in clinical practice, prognostic or predictive? And this is important. A prognostic test would help us identify risk of recurrence, would tailor our estimate of risk of recurrence based on the classic characteristics that we have, such as tumor size, node status. How can we refine that? And I would say that the genomic tools have not consistently show, shown predictive information, which means that by identifying different magnitudes of treatment benefit by risk subsets, so let's start with the Taylor X clinical trial. It's a study for patients with node negative, ER positive, and patients with oncotype between recurrence scores between 11 and 25. They were on the mice to endocrine therapy plus or minus chemotherapy. The study, as its primary hypothesis, was designed to show that endocrine therapy was not inferior to the, when compared to the combination. We know here the results, the curves are overlapping. But when we look by uh, the subset of patients with age below 50 or premenopausal patients, and as we increase the recurrence score levels, indicating probably increased risk, we start to see a separation of the curves in favor of chemotherapy, even in this population that had no negative and low oncotype score. The MIND active study has the primary endpoint as distant metastasis for survival. And it's a study that basically characterized patients based on clinical or genomic risk assessed by Mimaprint. And these patients were randomized again to get endocrine therapy plus or minus chemotherapy. The primary endpoint of the study focused on patients who had a high clinical risk and a low genomic risk, expecting that the five-year distant metastasis free survival would be good. And here we have the results with the updated survival, distant metastasis free survival analysis, showing that these patients indeed had a favorable outcome. Mind Act, as its secondary objectives, compared what was the benefit of chemotherapy in this population. Again, clinical high risk, but genomic low risk by Mimaprint. And in this graphic, we have chemotherapy versus not. And we see that chemotherapy does add benefit here in terms of distant metastasis free survival for the overall population. So uh, it's not a study that was designed to show that chemotherapy didn't work on this population. Here we have the overall study population. We see a separation of the curves as we have a longer follow-up. But what is driving this, it does seem to be age again, or patients that were below age 50 tend to benefit more from chemotherapy. And here on the right, patients with age above 50, we see that the curves tend to be overlapping, indicating that age in itself might be an indicator of uh, 
potentially higher risk and more benefit from chemotherapy across these studies. It's important here, again, to see that we're talking about a population that's defined as clinical high risk and genomic low risk. There are Exponder, uh, which is my favorite study, and I think that we have learned a lot from it. It's a study that basically took patients who had ear-positive disease with limited nodal involvement up to three positive nodes with a recurrence score below 25, and these patients were randomized again to uh, endocrine therapy plus or minus chemo. The primary endpoint, IDFS, but the primary hypothesis here, it's very interesting because this is a study that's very elegant. It was designed to show this positive interaction test of chemotherapy benefit with increasing recurrence score values. So it's really a prospective phase three clinical trial designed to show a predictive association between oncotype recurrence scores and chemo benefit. And here on this graphic, uh, we have uh, in blue, uh, risk for patients treated with hormonal uh, therapy, in orange patients treated with chemo plus hormonal therapy. And this is based on data from the SWOG 80814, and this forms the hypothesis for our exponder. And what we can see here on the uh, x-axis, we have uh, the recurrence score. As we increase the recurrence score, we see an increase in risk. But what we can see as we get the recurrence score 25, the curves, they start to cross. And this is indicating that the chemotherapy benefit, a hazard reduction here, seems to be greater at 25. So this forms the hypothesis for a predictive uh, uh, evaluation of oncotype as a test. This would indicate that oncotype uh, would depict patients who would benefit from chemotherapy with increasing values of oncotype recurrence score. But what was seen in the actual results of our exponder, it's shown here on the right, was that the chemotherapy benefit was the smallest as at 25 and greater when it was closer to zero. So the study was obviously a negative in the sense that it didn't uh, prove their hypothesis, and we did see that chemotherapy seemed to work uh, even more for patients with lower uh, oncotype recurrence score. So this is basically what was seen uh, with the results from our exponder. And as part of the primary analytic plan was to, uh, after you have failed to demonstrate an interaction, was to see the IDFS in the overall population. Again, here, chemotherapy versus hormonal therapy. And we see here that chemotherapy did add benefit for the overall study population with a hazard ratio of 0 0.8, with a significant p-value. But we can see here that the absolute difference was, again, uh, was small. But, uh, but the information here uh, basically shows that chemotherapy does work with this uh, impressive hazard ratio for this population. And one more time, the breakdown by the menopausal status is interesting because we see here on the left that the curves are really overlapping for the postmenopausal women, and we do see a significant benefit with chemotherapy for patients who are in the premenopausal setting or patients below age 50. It's also interesting to see the breakdown by the recurrence score levels here, 0 to 13 or 14 to 25. On the left, we have the postmenopausal patients. We can see, again, the curves are really overlapping. In the premenopausal setting, patients with oncotype very low between 0 to 13, they did seem to benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. We see a nice separation of the curves. And in the same, it's seen for patients with 14 and 25. This is consistent with the graphic that I showed before, that oncotype in itself is not predicting benefit. The benefit exists across the board, and there could be differences in terms of risk for premenopausal versus postmenopausal women in these populations. So what are the take-home messages that we have uh, for this test? They do provide reliable prognostic information. The prognostic information is valid for both postmenopausal and premenopausal women. I would say that they are very useful, and we do use them in our clinical practice to optimize treatment recommendations for postmenopausal women. And we do have these consistent results indicating chemotherapy benefit for premenopausal women. 
And this opens up a discussion that could take the whole presentation to try to understand why this happened. Maybe chemotherapy is putting patients into menopause, and the actual benefits that we're seeing here could be an indirect endocrine therapy effect. There are probably differences in adjuvant chemotherapy regimen that are given to premenopausal women versus postmenopausal women. I would expect that elderly patients to get less intense chemotherapy regimens. Chemotherapy was not a randomization factor on these clinical trials. There could be intrinsic biological differences for premenopausal women that we basically don't know, but it's very important for us when thinking about this data in our clinical practice. We need to avoid extrapolating the results to different populations. A patient with more nodal involvement or a different tumor size might benefit from chemotherapy regardless of genomic tests, and the clinical judgment remains crucial uh, when talking about chemotherapy. Now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about what do we know about chemotherapy benefit for a high-risk population or for patients where we feel, well, a patient really needs chemotherapy, and do we feel that the relative risk reduction that we get with chemotherapy to be different for specific subsets, ER high versus low, grade one versus three, and I would say that even myself for a long time, I had some intrinsic bias thinking that a high-grade cancer would benefit more from chemotherapy, that a patient who has a low level of ER would benefit more, but we have to stick with the data that's available. And here we have this uh, data from the Oxford meta-analysis from 2012 that really shows that the relative risk reduction that you get with AEC type regimens to be this very similar for patients with ER poor versus ER positive. We can see here that the relative risk reduction up to 0.8 and 0.7, it's basically similar across subsets. And in this same publication, the relative risk reduction with adjuvant anthracycline-based chemotherapy is strikingly similar across breast cancer subsets. Here we have age, nodal status, ER expression levels, histologic grade one, two, or three. So when we use chemotherapy, we're treating microscopic disease that we're not seeing, and we need to be careful uh, with our probably an intrinsic bias that exists that chemotherapy might work differently across breast cancer subsets unless we have data showing that. And one uh, area that's very important and relevant is are we ready to give up on anthracycline-based regimens? We all like to avoid the potential cardiac risk problems with anthracycline, but it's important for us again to look into the scientific evidence that's available and see how we, what, what can we get from these regimens. And I do like the, the Oxford overview meta-analysis because with large number of patients, we can see in, in, a, in a more reliable manner what can you achieve with these regimens. So here, when you compare anthracycline containing versus taxane-based regimens, in general, the anthracycline containing regimens, they are better, and they are better by 14% in terms of relative risk reduction. The other question is, when, what about those dense chemotherapy? Here we have data for 10,000 women comparing the same chemotherapy regimens given either two weekly or every three weeks. And again, the dose-dense regimen is associated with a 17% reduction in risk when compared to the standard three-weekly regimen. So in the next few slides, I want to share with you some ongoing efforts that uh, were involved trying to optimize treatment for patients who have high clinical risk and the hypothesis here was that those dense chemotherapy would be more effective if tumors that were classified as estrogen receptor positive by classic pathologists say they would have a low endocrine activity. To test our hypothesis, we used the test developed by Fraser Siemens at MD Anderson that's called the SET 23 assay that basically measures the transcriptional activity of the estrogen receptor, excluding the classic proliferation-related genes, and the results of the SET, the SET-ER, this is adjusted by stage and molecular subtype. To test our hypothesis, we use data from the CLGB9741. This is the classic study that led to the common use of those dense ACT. 
And this is a study for which we have the pen 15 intrinsic subtypes and, and ROR results available. And those were results that did not inform, did not predict who would benefit more from those dense chemotherapy versus not. So the idea that a high-grade cancer by a genomic subset, luminal B versus luminal A, or basal versus non-basal, would predict who benefits from a more intense regimen uh, was not the case on a previous publication. And here we did the set assay on the same subset of patients to try to compare these two different biological variables. And when we look at our results here, we just have the subset of patients classified as high set, indicating that the transcriptional activity of ER, the estrogen receptor, is activated by these tests. And it's interesting to see here that the distribution of luminal A and luminal B in this subset. So this is not measuring the same. You have a high set population where half of these patients are luminal A, half luminal B. So this is not a test that's measuring, again, proliferation or intrinsic subtypes. This is depicting a, a different biological phenomenon. And here, for the subset of patients who are classified as low set, indicating that the ER axis is probably not active, we do have a, a fair amount of these patients with what we consider to be indolent disease like lumina way. So, but our hypothesis was basically to see what this is telling us. And here on the left, we have the prognostic value of the set assay. And we see that patients here in the curve in black with high set having favorable survival outcomes. And what's interesting here of set in the CLGB study is that this is not a population with uh, limited node involvement. This is a prognostic assay that's showing value in stratifying a population that has a high risk, including many patients with more than four positive nodes. And on the right, once we overlay the curves for patients, the data uh, from PIN50 and RORPT, we can see the initial, in the bottom two curves, are patients classified as low set. They have an inferior outcome regardless of ROR-PT. And in the superior curves, patients with high set, they really did much better from a, a prognosis standpoint. But our question here in this research was not the prognostic association. We're trying to see if this assay would be predictive, would identify who benefits uh, from chemotherapy. And to test this predictive hypothesis, we have an interaction p-value here indicating that patients with low SAT, they did benefit more from those dense chemotherapy versus not with survival outcomes. So it's difficult to get a positive p-value for interaction with biomarker research. And here we believe that this data uh, is showing us a consistent result. And again, what is interesting and intriguing here is that this is a mix of patients who have luminal A, luminal B, Again, we're measuring a different biological phenomenon that is basically indicating a benefit, a survival benefit with those dense chemotherapy versus not. And more importantly, I would say that our results were consistent when looking for patients who were in the premenopausal and postmenopausal setting. There was no difference in the ability of SET to predict a survival benefit with those dense chemotherapy for younger and postmenopausal women. So, in our clinical practice, when chemotherapy is recommended, those dense ACT should still be considered if we have patients who are considered to be of high risk. I'm not saying that the less intense chemotherapy regimens shouldn't be used. We should always use them. In our clinical practice, we need to be clinicians and adjust our treatments. We want to avoid toxicities for many patients. So, there's a lot of uh, room for us to optimize treatment selection. And the less intensive, intensive regimens should be used for patients for which have comorbidities or, or maybe lower risk based on our assessment. The relative risk reduction that we get with adjuvant chemotherapy seems to be similar across subsets, and we should avoid getting to the trap of saying that a patient with a grade one cancer, your positive, doesn't benefit from chemotherapy. This patient may not need chemotherapy for having a good prognosis, but the predictive information is not there. 
And I would say that with subsequent validation, the SAT test could be used by physicians and patients to inform risk of recurrence, the prognosis, and maybe even more importantly, to identify subsets who benefit more from a specific therapies with a predictive information. So as I said, I would spend less time talking about the CDK inhibitors, but I think we do have important messages here. And I would say that there is a strong rationale for us to optimize treatments in the air positive setting. It's a tricky disease. It's a disease with a long natural history. Here we have data from the IBCSG studies on the left, stratifying risk by nodal status. Nodal status is a strong indicator of risk of recurrence in the initial five years as it is after five years. So it's relatively easy in our clinical practice to know who is really high risk which has implications to the use of novel agents like the CDK inhibitors. The challenge is here with the node negative uh, subset on the right, where we do see probably more of a benefit of the biological factors, including proliferation-based genomic tests to stratify risks for these patients. And when we see the, the publication that's often cited uh, from New England showing that the risk uh, of recurrence at 20 years for a small year positive breast cancer can be very high. We need to be careful. Our population nowadays probably doesn't have that much risk, but at the same time, I would say that there is a space for us to be more careful about really trying to understand what is the risk that we're trying to modify for a patient with, who has a small node negative cancer based on prognostic assays. And here's where the value is when we try to uh, evaluate the addition of novel agents. We have uh, four studies that have been reported uh, evaluating the adjuvant CDK inhibitors. I'm gonna focus here on the positive studies, but I would say that there is still a lot for us to learn from the studies that were negative, such as PALAS, and there are interesting presentations at this meeting, like on Friday, uh, Denis Tover be presenting uh, about uh, a very comprehensive genomic analysis on PALAS. So I think that we need to, to learn from both uh, sides, the positive and the negative studies. So we all know about the design of the MONARCH and the Natalie clinical trials. The MONARCH is the study that led to the approval of abemocyclib. Natalie, it's a study that evaluated ribocyclib for three years. The difference here is they study it's the study population where 30% of patients that were eligible for Natalie, they were not eligible for Monarch E because Monarch E did include a high risk population and Natalie was a bit more liberal in terms of including patients who had ER positive and node negative. Natalie used ribocyclic for a total of three years. Monarch e, as we know, abemocyclic for two years. Monarch had two cohorts. The majority of patients had a very high risk by classic tumor burden. He had the cohort two where you had the K67 being a requirement uh, as an indicator of risk. And we see here the median follow-up at 4.5 years. We see a dramatic reduction in risk in favor of a bemocycle before this population. So there is no doubt that this is a positive study. It's adding a lot of risk reduction for a high-risk population. And here we have a relatively uh, long follow-up with 4.5 years and really sustained a benefit that seems to be sustained over time. As I said, the K67 was included in one of the subsets. This is prognostic, but not predictive. Abemocycle works well regardless if it's low or high K67. Patients who have high K67 as patients who have grade three disease and any proliferation-based metrics, they have worse outcome. But the benefit uh, is the same once you add the bemocyclic to this population. And here we have the results from the two studies side by side. Not to do a comparison of these trials, there are different studies with different follow-up and different positive studies. It's important to see that both are large clinical trials with over 5,000 patients and positive uh, in terms of the benefit they're adding uh, in prevention of recurrence. 
But I want to bring here uh, one data from Natalie that I found interest, which is the IDFS by the anatomic stage. Here we have stage two and three. And I would say that I agree that there is consistent IDFS benefit with ribocyclob for patients with stage two or three. And the reason this sentence is correct is because when you look at the hazard ratio on the left of 0 0.76 and 0 0.74 on the right, this is showing what you're gaining in terms of relative risk reduction. But the reality is that if you have a low risk, a lower risk to be modified, you see curves as you see on the left where they tend to be overlapping because basically you're trying to modify a risk that's not as high for being a stage two population. And I think that this is gonna be a very important point as we uh, continue to discuss how we add these agents in our clinical practice. So what have we learned from these studies? There is a consistent treatment benefit with CDK inhibitors across patient subsets. Monarch shows a substantial and persistent benefit with adjuvant of amocyclib. I would say that with Natalie, we're gonna to continue to see more results. They're encouraging results up to this point, but there is notable differences in what we get in terms of the absolute benefits that we're trying to see or achieve with the addition of a new agent for stage two versus stage three. And we're talking about here positive disease. So long-term follow-up will be essential for us to continue to understand what is the magnitude of benefit of these agents, particularly when talking about survival outcomes. And the, the burning question here is, will we be able to identify a predictive biomarker for CDK inhibitors? And I ask an even more provocative question, have we made any progress in identifying who doesn't benefit from adjuvant hormonal therapy in the ER positive setting? I, I tend to believe that these drugs, they do work well for your positive disease as we had seen in the metastatic setting. And the challenge in the early stage setting, in my mind, is gonna to be to identify who has enough risk to be modified and justify an addition of a novel agent. So to put this all together, I would say that risk stratification remains very important as we make our treatment decisions. The genomic tools that we use they provide us with prognostic information for both postmenopausal and premenopausal women. I would say that we're gonna do better by the time we have predictive biomarkers because the predictive biomarker is gonna indicate uh, at the biological level who is benefiting from what. And I would say that when chemo is considered those dense ACT for high-risk patients is the best regimen that we have less intense regimens, they do play a role. We all use it. We should avoid getting into the trap again of imagining that the relative risk reduction would be different based on assumptions uh, that we have from biology. And I would say that uh, we need to be careful as to avoid under-treating patients given that the intention of chemotherapy is to increase survival outcomes. With the CDK inhibitors, we have benefit and consistent uh, benefits across subsets. I think that risk stratification here will be key. We need to see what is the risk that we're trying to modify. And in reality, I would say that adjuvant treatment decisions, it will always require a thoughtful judgment. Clinical decisions, they are not easy. The data generation will always come in a staggered manner We'll never have a study that where all patients got the, all the correct chemotherapy, all patients got the correct amount of hormonal therapy, ovarian suppression versus not, CDK versus not. So it keeps changing. And we as clinicians, we need to understand this data as it, it's presented to us and try to put it into context when treating our patients, having a conversation with them, listening about their preferences, and trying to be very clear about the risk that we're trying to modify. We cannot just keep adding medication after medication for all patients. So it's really, uh, it's, it's a very interesting area and I think it's gonna continue to be like that. And there are additional factors that we know that play a role in terms of risk reduction. There is now a, 
a large amount of data linking obesity with risk of recurrence. So we as clinicians, we have to educate our patients, we have to educate them about the potential benefits with physical exercise because we might do as well in treating these additional uh, risk factors as we do with mod medications. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we can uh, start the Q&A session. We have uh, 20 minutes for discussion questions. Yes, I've, I've got one. Uh, Judy Ann Chapman. I was a statistician for MA27, and there's more information that may be useful to you if you think of both ER and PR, not as just positive or negative. There's, in the poster session tomorrow, we're going to show the big MA27 trial that if you both quantitate the ER and PR, and if you statistically standardize, so the numbers are going to mean something, one lab to another, that there's very useful, significantly different information just by your standard ER and PR. So I hope some of you, if you're interested in this, are able to pop by uh, poster session one tomorrow, 12 to two o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for the information. Please go ahead, in front uh, of me, yes. Hi, I'm Ashwini but I'm one of the medical oncologists at Baylor Scott and White at Central Texas. Um, and I have two questions uh, about the adjuvant use of CDK46 inhibitors. Um, when some of the patients were uh, started on endocrine therapy, uh, the adjuvant abemaciclib was not approved yet. So one, the first question is, can you add it now? Like. Uh, during any time, or is it too late for some patients to add the adjuvant abemaciclib? Um, second question is, um, the ribocyclib is not approved yet, but um, say in the future, hypothetically, it does get approved, and a patient is a candidate for either abemaciclib or ribocyclib, which one would you use? Otto, I think that is Thanks for your questions. Those are uh, provocative and interesting. I would say that we have to stick with the data from clinical trials, and I would not start an adjuvant CDK inhibitor for patients who are on hormonal therapy for quite a few years. It's hard to imagine uh, that we can extrapolate that much. And uh, your second question, uh, I think we need to see uh, the publication of the results with ribocyclob. And, and, and basically use the information uh, in a, as we do once we have uh, different studies showing benefit. There is a space for discussion with your uh, patient. There is a space for you to consider uh, the subsets of patients that you're treating. So if it's more of a high-risk patient and you feel that the data, you feel more comfortable with uh, data X or Y, and you should make this decision will not have any comparison of these two clinical trials. There are also issues with tolerability with these medications. So in reality, I think that as, we, as we've done with uh, different hormonal therapies over the years, like tamoxifen versus AI, I think there will be some of that as well uh, with the CDK inhibitors. And hopefully, we'll have uh, more than one agent to prove it soon. Please. My name is Uchol No from Korea, and I'm the principal investigator of the Korean Astra trial. I have a question about the duration of ovarian suppression. So in Astra trial, we use two years of OFS instead of five years, and we showed it works actually. I wouldn't say two years is better than five years or something, but I like to say the duration of OFS could be individualized, individualized based on patient factors such as side effect or age of the patients. For say, for instance, older premenopausal women in their late 40s or early 50s, five years of OFS could be a definite over-treatment, I guess. So uh, what do you think about the optimal duration of ovarian suppression for premenopausal women? 
Thank you uh, for your question. There, you know, it's good to have um, um, d different options. Uh, personally, I try to continue the treatment for five years, especially in the younger women, the higher risk women. But you know, if there are uh, issues with tolerance, um, then uh, we definitely the data are useful to discuss with the patient, consider stopping the ovarian suppression part of the treatment a little bit earlier. Obviously, um, th this is true with tamoxifen. If you start an aromatase inhibitor, it's a little bit, you you'll have to change that medication as well. And it's also helpful with the women who are, are not very young, but women who are, as you've mentioned, in their late 40s, early 50s, when you're not sure if and when they transition to menopause, especially if they got chemotherapy. So again, based on tolerance and preference, um, I think the data are very helpful for us, and we can consider stopping ovarian suppression after two or three years um, and keep them on um, either you know, tamoxifen by itself, and if the woman is a little bit older and you're not sure about her menopausal status and want to maintain her in the aromatase inhibitor, probably do some monitoring of estradiol levels. But you know, the data are very, very helpful, and I use it uh, individually with patients to guide their treatment. The microphone on my right. Yes. Uh, given the known benefit of the anthracyclines, in which situation uh, you use TC, and if you do so, plus six or plus four? And another question, if you have any experience with CBD and hormone therapy? So I'm afraid that I don't have a, a clear answer that's applicable to all patients or a recipe that we could say that who should get an ACT regimen versus TC. My inclination is to consider risk as the size of the cancer and all those status as robust prognostic factors. So for patients who have more nodal involvement, maybe three positive nodes, patients who are young, they have no comorbidities, a very long life expectancy. Those are patients for which I tend to offer ACT as the best chemotherapy regimen. I think that the long-term cardiac risk for this patient is not to be as high. The opposite of this spectrum are patients who have comorbidities. They are not so young. They have, for example, diabetes. They have hypertension. And we have uh, the possibility of this cause, the possibility of using regimens such as TC. And I would say that in our practice, most of us, we tend to use TC uh, as four cycles. We know of the data of giving it for six cycles. It is uh, challenging for us to use data from uh, one specific clinical trial to change uh, the recommendations. I personally feel that TC is a tough regimen from a taxotere uh, toxicity standpoint. And going uh, even further with your question, uh, we, we have patients for which they're uh, relatively frail or have even more comorbidities where uh, I still use regimens that are very old, like CMF, which is a regimen that tends to be uh, well tolerated and sometimes better tolerated than TC. And we also know that it's an effective regimen. I think the ABC data also show that um, you know anthracycline doesn't necessarily add to benefit except in the highest risk patients. I think there is a debate on this at San Antonio, uh, who gets anthracycline and who doesn't. Uh, so you should all uh, tune into that because uh, clearly this is not sorted. Um, hi, uh, my question is for really young premenopausal women, like say less than 35 or even less than 30, patients who have completed their pregnancies and children. What do you guys think about oophorectomies? And again, in patients high risk, not low risk, so like stage three, for example. Yeah, so, um, you know, we have to consider the potential long-term uh, risks of uh, you know, low, low estrogen environment for those women, and I try to individualize it. Uh, I try for most women, unless they have a genetic uh, predisposition for ovarian cancer, uh, I try to start with the chemical ovarian suppression so they know what it's like to 
uh, be in this low estrogen environment. Um, and then, you know, it, it gives me some time to um, discuss this option with them. Um, I think it's a little bit easier for women in their 40s, um, or especially women who got chemotherapy who might already uh, be entering menopause a little bit earlier to consider it. Uh, for the very young women, um, I think uh, the, you know, the, the potential detrimental effect of, of long-term estrogen deficiency on bone and heart and so on is not very well known. I think we'll, you know, we'll have more, more data um, and, and from more um, follow-up on, on soft and, and text and other studies, hopefully, but uh, it has to be individualized and risks and benefits considered for your uh, patient sitting in front of yeah, you. Yeah, no, I agree. I wouldn't say that for everybody, but, but some of those patients who are really high risk and have completed their five years or are tired of getting the shots and have already completed childbearing and, you know, yeah. think about the long term. Thank you. Very fair. Yeah. Uh, hi, um, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> another excellent session. I, I have a question for Dr. Friedman. There's clearly still a lot of discussion about, you know, the duration of extended endocrine therapy, and um, you sort of suggested in one of your earlier slides that most patients should have 10 years if you've made that decision uh, to extend endocrine therapy. But you also suggested that the BCI can be used to help decide you know, whether the duration of extended endocrine therapy, and traditionally, you know, we haven't used sort of MGAs to uh, decide upon extended endocrine therapy. So I just wanted to explore a little bit more how you decide whether to go for seven or eight years or 10 years for extended endocrine therapy. I mean, I think from what we know, um, seven or eight years is probably as good or close to as good as 10 years. And so I think, if you have that really high-risk patient and you just want to do everything you can, those are the patients I would probably push to 10 years, or the patients who are very motivated or ones where they're particularly concerned about a contralateral breast, because I think a lot of the benefits over time are related to second cancers. Um, those are the people, I think, who I would typically go to 10 years with. And again, their bone density loss is okay, they're tolerating it okay, and those people who make it to five years are tolerating it okay and can continue. But I think all of those factors come into play. In our practice, we aren't, I, I couldn't help but mention breast cancer index and um, other um, assays that are really trying to provide um, some prognostic and predictive value for extension of therapy. I think in most cases, I'm not sure that they're doing more than the clinical factors, although there are studies within a lot of these um, large trials I've shown you that show that it can, you know, low breast cancer index predicts for lack of benefit in years, you know, six through 10. So I think I actually haven't sent it or used it in my practice, but the person I could imagine sending it in is somebody who does have very high risk disease, um, anatomically perhaps, who is having a hard time or you want to get a sense of that, you know, have a little bit more information to make that decision. But otherwise, it's not something that I am yet using. Yeah. But it's, it exi it's also the test is $3,000, I think. So yeah. there's that um, factor as well. Yeah. And, and, and just finally, you'd be happy with five years of tamoxifen for low-risk uh, patients? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, uh, thank you so much for that excellent talk. Um, I was just wondering, I have um, young patients who are say stage three, very high risk, and they struggle a lot with the ovarian suppression aspect. Um, they'll, they'll ask me like, what's my percent benefit? And I think, I think everyone in this room, just because we have all these great tools and options, doesn't mean we need necessarily use them in every patient. So for the premenopausal patients that are struggling with ovarian suppression, you know, what do you use to help guide your decision? How hard do you push them in terms of, you know, getting that five years of ovarian suppression? Um, I tried the UK Predict in her, and she was maybe 1% benefit at five years or 10 years. And, you know, when I go back on Monday, I'll probably tell her that, and she's probably not going to be very happy. <laughs> but um, that's 
for your first question. And then my second question is, in, I have a few postmenopausal patients who have had long-term HRT and then they suddenly have an ERP or positive breast cancer and they get very angry with me that I want them to stop their hormone replacement therapy and then suppress their estrogen. Um, how do you manage those patients? And then I didn't know if you could mention when do you use adjuvant bisphosphonates on your patients? Sorry, that was a lot of questions. Uh, I'll start with your ovarian uh, suppression uh, question. And, you know, we talked a lot about risk stratification and, um, you know, trying to use some tools to help us estimate the benefit from each of the treatments, right? So um, you go through a decision-making, the patient starts on uh, ovarian suppression and either tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors, and, yes, yeah, some struggle, and over time, uh, it's pretty tough. You know, they've been through a lot of therapy, right? M many of them would have received chemotherapy, maybe um, uh, dealing with, with local uh, therapy-related complications. So I go back to the equation. I go back, remember, this is what we talked about months ago, and this is the benefit. And, um, you know, I go back to that tool from the soft and, and tech studies and say, at the end, you know, you're probably okay with just tamoxifen by itself. Uh, I encourage you to at least try that for five years. Um, so, and, you know, most patients, some of them want to go through whatever treatment, but quality of life is important. We, we put them through this treatment to keep them alive. Um, and, you know, I hope that we will have better um, opportunities to look at minimal di residual disease and truly guide therapy in the future uh, for those patients. We're not quite there yet. So uh, hopefully you can have a balanced discussion with your patient um, next week. Um, you know, I can at least start talking about HRT and, and then pa pass it to my, my colleagues. Um, you know, it, it's a risk factor, right? It's, it's a fuel. Um, and um, I, I've seen those <laughs> angry patients, but depending on the number of years they've been on and the type of treatment, especially the progesterone is the bad guy, um, I encourage them to stop it. And uh, what they do with the information at the end is beyond your control. Um, we didn't talk a lot about side effects, but, um, you know, low dose uh, vaginal estrogens, um, again, quality of life consideration can be um, uh, talked about with patients who have a lot of vaginal dryness and other symptoms. Uh, it's risk versus benefit, and at the end, um, you, you can share the data, but you cannot uh, necessarily, you, you know, you will not be prescribing it, but hopefully they will take a good listen and uh, follow your recommendation. And if you want to follow on that and the bisphosphonate sure. oh, as yeah. well. I can also yeah, comment a little bit more too in practice. You know, I think a lot of patients on HRT have been on it for decades and they don't even know what life is like without it, but they worry. And so I think sometimes it's just reassuring them that it might be okay, right? Or um, go slowly with coming off. I think sometimes there's not a rush to this. And I think sometimes patients will do better if you have a sort of graded approach um, to taking them off. Um, I think some of it depends on what their symptoms are, too. I mean, what are they taking HRT for, right? Because if it's for hot flashes, there's alternative therapies. If it's for vaginal dryness, there's topical therapies that we think are safer. Um, but I've had a few patients over the years who won't come off, and those are people who I try to do tamoxifen in, honestly, uh, because, you know, you really want to try to protect them as much as you can, and I think an aromatase inhibitor is not doing them as much good in that setting. Um, but we don't really know. I mean, I think... Most people come off. I've had a few patients who, who won't, but I think most of, most people get it and um, and are willing to do it. Bisphosphonates? Um, oh, bisphosphonates. Um, so I know we didn't include that in our talk. It's a huge topic. Um, you know, bisphosphonates in the adjuvant setting consistently do lower the risk of recurrence modestly. Um, this has been tested in multiple populations. Um, I think in, and there's been guidelines about this, there's a lot, there's a lot you can reference for this. I think in practice, practically speaking, um, I do um, focus it more on the higher risk patient. Um, of course, somebody who has the dual um, indication for bone density loss or somebody you're worried about bone density loss. Um, but in the lowest risk patients, it's not something that I typically uh, will give at this point in time. Um, you know, most of most bisphosphonates are, of course, safe, but there are some downsides, and so you have to kind of have those conversations, like with everything. If you have anything to add, but. we have Sorry. a very last question, a quick question. Microphone on my left. Thanks so much, uh, Markus Vetter from Basel, Switzerland. Um, just a short question. Um, 
how would you implement this in this treatment landscape new opportunities like checkpoint inhibitors or <laughs> like PARP inhibitors? So if I listen to your question while you're asking about novel agents like checkpoint inhibitors and PARP inhibitors, correct? So I think that the PARP inhibitors, uh, we should uh, be aware and remember the data that we have with uh, adjuvant dilaparib for patients who have BRCA alteration. Sometimes we don't think about the BRCA carrier as your positive disease, but it's not, it's not as rare, so we should always consider uh, adding the adjuvant for olaparib for patients who have BRCA alterations. And I think that your, your second question for the checkpoint inhibitors, this is an area that we're still touching the surface. We'll see some interesting results here in San Antonio this year, showing that these agents may work for subsets of patients with ER positive disease. And I am personally very interested in biased because of my own results to see whether uh, the benefit of these agents will vary by the, the set assay because this is an assay that's indicating that there is a subset of patients with your positive disease that probably the axis is not activated. So they may have a different biology. So I think we have like at least a rationale to evaluate whether these agents may work differently uh, by this type of evaluations. And there is also the, the component of the TILS evaluation because in your positive disease for being a low-grade disease, sometimes we have less in terms of immune infiltration and we would probably need to have TILS in place for these agents uh, to be effective. If we're taking the break from an immune uh, effect, we need the immune cells to be there. But again, we haven't seen the data yet from these trials, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this evolves and how we put all this together with all these additional agents that we're using in our clinical practices. And I think you also raised a really important point, which is how to deal with all of these uh, new developments. And, you know, the data are obviously coming out bit by bit. And how do we incorporate extension data with the use of CDK4-6 inhibitors? I mean, is it even as important? Or are the oncotype data and, 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 and predictors of chemotherapy benefit as important if you're going to be doing all these other additional layers of therapy, extension of therapy, CDK4-6 inhibition, olaparib for patients with BRC mutation. So I, I honestly think that's the biggest um, challenge right now is sort of trying to put it all together, um, especially in that highest risk patient where you just want to give them everything, but it's hard to even quantify um, when you have all those layers. Thank you. I think that we can close uh, this educational set session. Thank you very much to all the speakers for the outstanding presentation and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.